What's going on, everybody? Welcome into Debate Night. Hunter just like he's timing it up. I love it. Um, we got a great show tonight. Lots of fun topics and some great guests. Um, somebody who's not a guest, a mainstayer. He has residency here, Brody Smith. Yeah, you know, uh, it is what it is. Man of the people here. Uh, last episode, pretty good. Nothing too crazy. I don't even think the comments were that bad. Not really anything to even mention, honestly. Wow. wow. Yeah, sure really nothing. Nothing thing. really stood out to me. Um, there, I mean, there was some conspiracy theories as always mm-hmm. with you coming back and being the host and, and allotting points. Uh, but I won't get into that, but, uh, no, yeah. actually I want to know what's the theory. I mean, it's, it's a back and forth situation. There's, you know, there's, there's people on this side of the fence. There's people on that side of the fence that, you know, it just depends on where you are. Oh, I'll, I'll just People love conspiracy I, theories. I, there's just, yeah, there's no, a theory I, I, floating I, around that you have a, a, a very strong anti-Brody bias. Just a theory <laughs> out there floating around. Well, that's not true. That's not true. I'm pretty sure there's got to be a positive correlation with my salary and making Brody win. So I don't think that could ever be. I don't think Brody's ever, ever only ever won on when I'm hosting. Well, that, then maybe you that, could that, argue that, that you have, have so too much of a positive correlation. <laughs> that what, maybe that, that could be the so argument. I, I'm not the one saying it. I'm just I'm I'm just a uh, uh, assistant of the people. Brody, Brody's about to win. I'm by not the man 100. of the people, just the assistant. And just to shut down the argument, Brody's about to win by the be largest fair, margin though, in history. To be fair, I do think I went on a nice little streak when I was standing. So did I not? Did I not standing, give you the win like Brody a few weeks ago? Uh, I don't think I've won the season yet with you hosting. Maybe you got. Maybe it was just you got to the finals a few weeks ago. I don't remember. I think Anyways. I went to the finals once. Jake's back. Jake the Snake. <laughs> Yeah, I'm returning after uh, speaking of comments, had some really good comments thrown my way after my last appearance. So I'm looking forward <laughs> for some redemption here. And uh, we got some good topics this week. I'm excited for them. Jake's, Jake's a guy that perseveres. Um, Hunter is also here. Looks great. Yeah. Sounds great. Uh, had a meeting run long today, uh, right around the three o'clock time. So I didn't get to plan any notes, but luckily I had about 15 minutes, jotted down some notes on a piece of paper there. So I saw your notes. I'm ready to roll. Um, that's not true. Hunter was not in a meeting. He was playing Angry Birds. Uh, Brad that's is also joining us. Play? Um, Brad hasn't been on the show since his impromptu bullpen appearance, like early in this season where he had no time to prepare. So this is really Brad's right. actual debut. This is like his other one is like when they bring on the young kid from the Academy, like in the 90th minute, mm. just to get some like, uh, experience. This is his real full bit debut. Hello. I'm fresh off my first MA4 win. Let's go. Uh, I've graduated out of MA4. Uh, I was rated 825. I know you hate this, Brody. Uh, and no, I'm now... No, I sh- rating I shot- should, should be for amps. So Perfect. you're fine. Yeah. So I shot a 915, and I won my MA4 round. There you go. Well, that sounds you, like a wait, so you're not margin. playing MA4 anymore? Correct. Is that like a decision you made because you won, so now you yep. move up? Oh, okay. Yep. Nice. Yeah, yeah it was either that's... if I rated out or if I won something, I was going to move up to MA3. I'm like just that. getting ahead of the sandbagging allegations, just beating them from the start. Oh, I yeah. got those. I got those in. Uh... I don't think you can win MA4 or MA3 by a good margin and not get the allegations, though. That's probably just that signing you play well. Yeah, like, yeah, it's just going to happen. Got, some dude's going to be mad that he plays yep. MA4 20 it's times. It's almost a year. like the ratings are kind of like messed up to where they Ooh, should. Whoa, dude. They should just actually be like. If you play good, oh, no. that's what your rating should be. I haven't be. looked at or, it yet, oh, but no, apparently, I think somebody, never... apparently somebody emailed us the algorithm. Yeah, they did. Did you look at it? Betting? I did not yet. Oh, I, we do have I'm it scared if I open it up, my eyeballs are going to like like blow up out of my head. Like It's, it's, just, a live, it's just a live cam of Chuck Kennedy doing math. <laughs> Just, here, just him with a, a calculator. <laughs> it's like, yeah, God, it's he's like got to get ready by next Tuesday. <laughs> you can't look at the ratings algorithm. It's like the arc in, uh, in, in Indiana Jones. It just melts your face. You can't, Trevor, you need it. a, you need to ask in a year from now to like, Hey, can you guys actually send me that algorithm again? I lost that email and then see if both of them match up. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Good point. That's true. Um, all right. right. We're going to hop into our first topic of the day, uh, of the night debate night that is um we're gonna talk about the prodigy baskets because man people love to talk about the prodigy baskets right now so prodigy baskets made an all-time bad showing at the preserve was spit out so bad they had their own sponsored players calling them trash on the hot mic just 
it, it, it's just a great clip there. Um, is there actually just cause for the Pro Tour to take action against these baskets and others? And how many of these baskets should or would be banned from competition? Is this something that they really have room to be doing? Uh, Brody, what do you think? So the first thing, I'm, I'm not the greatest person to ask when it comes to baskets because I kind of look at, ba- well, first off, my memory's trash, but I also look at baskets similar to like how PJ Tour pros look at like greens. I use the week of practice leading up to the tournament to learn the baskets and learn where the sweet spots are. So if you ask me right now, hey, what's the sweet spot on this basket? I wouldn't be able to tell you. I do know like the red and blue ones, which one, I don't know which ones those are. Veterans, maybe uh, no one yeah. else. Vet, those veterans, like the sweet spot of that, like the, if you go high right and red and blue, those will actually catch. If you go high right and like the basket that I have in the backyard, which is like the, I think the chain star light, I believe is what I have. If you go high right in that, pushes it out. So there is a little bit of like trying to learn the baskets. Now, what I will say is like those putts. Some of those putts are tough to watch especially when you have the player like going down to bend up to pick up their disc or mini and it pushes out, um, especially with Isaac, he doesn't putt with a lot of pace, but there needs to be a discussion. What are we trying to do with the basket is a perfect putt. And you guys have had this discussion before is a perfect putt hitting what people quote unquote call dead center. Is that like the perfect putt? Like no matter what the speed is, if it hits right there, is that what a good putt is? Or should we looking at changing the putt of where it needs to like be going down, descending into the basket? Something to be asked. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely a a big part of the equation is like, what are we trying to accomplish? Cause you mentioned right now, it does feel like you have to learn a different putt for every basket because they all treat putts differently. Um, Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Jake, what are your thoughts on the basket situation? I would agree with Brody in the sense that I do think that players need to learn each basket, much like they learn a green in ball golf. Then I did a little bit of research as well into what the PDGA actually does in their decision process for how they release baskets and the disc uh, rules and regulations are pretty long. And then the guidelines for targets. Second paragraph is these design and construction specifications only have an indirect connection with the target's ability to catch discs. How well a target catches discs is not tested. I don't know how we test that process. And I think that's something that we have to have some big minds in disc golf, maybe get together and start figuring out if chain outs is going to be a problem that pros on the pro tour are going to complain about, then we should be looking into that uh, because a little bit further down, it does say that championship targets are heavy duty construction and meet the narrowest set of specifications specifications to provide more uniformity for events at the highest championship level. If their goal is uniformity, these spit outs are kind of the definition of inconsistency, right? Surprises. Like Brody just said, if a disc hits the middle, sometimes it drops, sometimes it goes right through. So how are we achieving that uniformity? How is the PDGA looking into consistency? I think that's a conversation we need to have rather than, you know, what's the perfect putt is what's causing these baskets to spit out so much and how do we fix them in the rules and regulations that the PDGA puts out? Yeah, good point. I mean, you, you said it, you know, you, when you read those words, it's like I start to the PDJ loves using big words and saying things. And then it's like, what is that actually accomplishing um, to the narrowest standards? Like, what are the standards? Like, what are we actually trying to do? Um, Hunter, what do you think about the prodigy baskets in the pro tour potentially banning baskets? Well, yeah, I mean, first off, I don't know if it's necessary. I mean, the pro tour could because it it could be like specifically on the pro tour. I think the problem that they'll run into there is the fact that they're not bringing these baskets in. A lot of times the baskets that are on the course are either being brought in by the presenting sponsor or the baskets that exist. For instance, I'm pretty sure the reason this was so, I could be wrong here, but I'm pretty sure the reason this was so jaw dropping was the baskets on the preserve seem to be the old T ones, which we have a lot of experience playing on old T ones. They've actually improved the T one in modern days because they wanted to address a lot of what was going on. So I think that's more the problem the PD, the pro tour runs into the PDGA is I think where you, you would kind of have to go with this with the, actually defining some of the specifications, maybe figuring out a way to test how they catch. Um, I love Brody's opinion on you need to learn the basket. We actually talked to basically one of the founders of disc golf at Oak Grove, the original disc golf course out there. And he was talking about how the sport needs to get back to having more touch. 
putting should be a touch thing. So in my opinion, when you said which baskets should be banned, the first three that came to my mind are prodigy baskets. We just saw that, right? Veteran baskets for the opposite reason. I think stuff gets through them too easily. And then mock X's for the complete opposite reasons because you could throw a forehand full power from 20 feet and it catch on a mock X. I think all of those are wrong. In my opinion, we should actually have the Pro Tour standardize some type of basket for manufacturers to make that is closer to a marksman where you want to hit low and in the cage, and it's more of a touchy motion than just jam it home in the center. And, you know, some are spit out, some are bad putts, but it all looks bad. Yeah, definitely. A lot of people do like the idea of the touchy putts. I think usually the counter argument to those is those who are like, well, then how are we going to throw in? 250 feet on a flex forehand like it it's always that back and forth of like well we have no more aces but we have a ton of aces usually um brad what do you think about the basket crisis in disc golf i mean it's a tough look for prodigy they've had a tough week i think yeah uh people leaving and now this basket i, I mean have you ever seen a compilation put out by the pro tour of basket fails <laughs> like how often did they run that it's not even a highlight reel it's a low light reel they, they showed the spit outs constantly and it was consistent every single time. Same spot, right in the middle, ball right out. Dance around the little springy middle part of those prodigy baskets and roll out the back. Uh, yeah, ban, ban them. They're terrible. The answer, I think, is the, the, the Pro Tour is a touring company and they tour with camera equipment. They tour with everything else. Why not tour with baskets? There's no reason that they can't create a coupler and take the current basket off the pole, put on the Pro Tour basket. Problem solved. Now, how you get that basket decided on, it gets murky because it's going to be whoever has the largest pockets to pay the Pro Tour and say, this is the one you're going to use. So, personally, I'm a fan of the MVPs. And the DGA, I think it's the Mach 7. I love seeing a high putt get ramped off the top and just sail for miles. I love the carnage. I want to <laughs> see that part. I don't want to see something hit the middle and fall out. Yeah, I, I, and we've talked about quite a bit now. I feel like we've talked about the idea of the Pro Tour, you know, using whether they make a basket or they just have a bidder or whatever, because I think we would all you know, whichever company, like, let's say, let's just say Innova, you know, they bought the rights and they were the standard basket. Um, there would still be spit outs and they would get that bad attention. And, you know, people might be saying we need to, everybody will always say they prefer a different basket because everybody puts differently, but at least then it would be consistent week to week. Um, I just wonder, and a lot, some of you touched on it, but I just wonder like what really does go into the innovation of the basket? Like, is anybody, there is so many infinite things you can do to catch a disc it hasn't been even really innovated in, in years and years and years. Um, so I just wonder if anybody's even thinking about that. Like, I feel like there's almost market space. You know, everybody's innovating the disc right now. This is the, the you know, new overmold, undermold, whatever technology, this and that. I think if a company came out tomorrow and said, we've created a new disc golf basket that's better than the rest, and it and it showcased something that's just a little bit different, I think you'd sell a lot of those baskets. Um because it's just like it's a market nobody's attacking right now. Everybody's trying to make affordable baskets, but nobody's looking to make one that's new um, and innovative in any way. So I don't, I don't know. It's it's been weird. Yeah. One additional note when we when you're talking about like adding touch back to the putt, you know, if we go and we look at one of the more challenging holes under pressure, hole 17 at USDGC, I think one of the reasons too that is a challenging shot is because it's not a full power shot you have to throw something with touch. You can't just right. muster something out there. So if you do have a, let's say, a pretty high pressure putt from 25 feet and you're able just to slam it in there, um, that's something to think about too, is when you start having to add that touch, when you have the more pressure added, I think it's way harder. Guys want to throw hard. They want to putt hard when the pressure is the highest. And uh, I think that is making the game easier. And we're trying to find ways to make it harder without it, you know, being fluky and gimmicky with the, the these toughest spit thing. Outs. Yeah. The toughest thing with like a, let's just say a basket that's more, um, 
you know, better for the finesseful putt, the softer putt is then when the wind picks up, it becomes very difficult because guys are no longer able to just jam putts in and trying to putt something. That's where you go spinny though. Right. That's what it would definitely add a a new element to the, uh, to the wind putting game. Cause I think that's especially where you see those harder putters excel because they're just jamming them in um, before the wind can do anything. But um, it would make the yeah, it would make the game a whole lot different. Disc golf would have gone in a very different direction as a sport had baskets stayed in a manner where let's just say there wasn't chains. Let's say you were just trying to hit a pole and land, right? Putting would look so much different. It'd be so oh. much harder. You could make the argument that that it would uh yeah, it, it could it would just be a whole different sport. That's all I'll well, say. As for <laughs> and as for looks, uh shout out to the company that makes the disc golf baskets in New Zealand. Those things look like the wrought iron cage with the twist. Yeah. I don't think there's any cooler looking basket than that one. Yeah. That, that, nobody. Yeah. Everybody's just kind of stuck with the similar design these days. Um, all right. We're going to move on to our next topic here. Um, it's that time of the year where, I mean, I think these rules were proposed a while ago, but if for whatever reason, the PDGA decided to post about it and it caught everybody's attention this time. Um, but always love seeing the PDGA proposed rules. And one of the proposed rules for the PDGA in 2025 is the addition of 60 second timeouts that players can call twice per round, which has been met with ridicule and backlash from fans and players alike. So I want to know, should disc golf be abandoning any and all rules related to specific time and leaning on the idea of a gentleman's sport, or do they need to commit all the way to specific time regulations to leave no room for guest work? Um, You know, this is kind of a balance you've been dealing with for years now with certain players being slow and then implementing some rules that have ambiguous language versus some that have specific time. It's like, is the mix going to work? Should we lean one way or the other? What should we do? Jake, what do you think? I think the timeout idea just straight up is is ridiculous right now when we don't have players that are calling each other on the cards currently for time violations. And when I think about the two alternatives, we have the way things are currently when you're watching a player set up for their shot and they're taking all this extra time and you have to wait and wait and wait. Yeah, it's annoying. But the alternative of constantly having players calling each other out or, or marshals calling each other out and people taking timeouts, I think that takes away from the flow of the game as well. I think it would start to affect players' psyches a little bit more. Everyone's counting. Everyone's watching their back. And who's going to enforce those rules is a conversation we always tend to have, right? Is it a course marshal? Is it the players? Because, again, the the players aren't calling these things on each other. So I think the idea of of 60-second timeouts is a bit unnecessary right now until we figure out a better way to enforce these rules. Um, Until then, I'll watch Nico take three minutes to set up his putt it's fine. It's not hurting the game too much. We talk about negative drama before. I think the negative drama comes from when players start to go after each other on the course for rule violations and something like this, I think would just slow down the game too much. Yeah, it definitely, um, it definitely would be something that it'd be interesting to see if it actually did get any use or if the pros amongst each other were, were using them. Uh, Hunter, what do you think about the, uh, the time language used in, in all these rules? Well, the timeout specifically, I think, is funny because we're giving more power to people who are already not using the power they have to manage the time. So why are we expecting them to really care about 60 seconds when the timeout's up and then the timeout turns into whatever? Uh, I would like to implement timeouts into debate night, if that's possible. I think that'd be a great addition. You know, I can just call a timeout, get a minute to just reconfigure my thoughts. Um, Timing-wise, specifically, though, I do think that this is where it's important for the pro tour and local stuff to have two separate rules because you're trying to solve two very different problems on the local scene. I think it does need to be specific, right? Because as a local TD, it's going to be basically impossible for me to run everything I have to run and go out on the course and manage it all when I'm a one person show. So I do need the players to be all the power in their hands, much more self officiated on the pro tour. We have marshals, we have staff, we have stuff that we can implement. So I think that the Pro Tour should go more the PGA route, which I looked into, and it appears that basically the first card out has a certain amount of time that they're expected to finish the round. Every card after them just has a gap they're supposed to keep, and there's rules basically for like, oh, a par three is this, a par four is treated this. And if you're not keeping up with that, then boom, that's where the issues come in. I think that makes more sense because then on a shot where I'm in the woods and I might need 45 seconds, that's fine. As long as I'm only taking 20 seconds on a shot when I'm in the middle of the fairway, I don't need that much time. All that matters is, am I keeping pace with the group in front of me? I think that's the way it should go for the pro tour. And then I think we should have specific rules for more local tournaments, but no timeouts anywhere. 
Yeah, that's a good point. With the local tournaments, obviously, those events have to be managed a completely different way, and and it doesn't seem like the rules are acknowledging that gap. Um, Brad, what are your thoughts on on the these rules disputes? Yeah, this one's an interesting one. I uh, I don't know if anybody watches poker. Anyone's a poker fan? Sure. Couple couple years ago, main event, guys were taking nine, ten, twelve minutes to play a single hand Jeez. because they were sitting. And just wasting time, just trying to jump payouts, right? But they introduced a shot clock. There's an iPad sitting on the table, and the dealer goes, yep, there's your 30 seconds. And every player is given time bank chips. Mm -hmm. This is where I think disc golf could draw from. The person doesn't throw in the time bank chip. The dealer keeps track and says, hey, you owe me a chip because you took longer than your time. Or now Mm -hmm. you owe me two chips because you took longer than your time. I think that that would be the way to do it, but it has to be with a marshal on every card, and that marshal needs to be held responsible because it's the clear thing from watching the broadcast is that the marshals aren't giving out these uh, citations or or calling penalties enough. I mean, we saw lots of instances this last weekend of people taking too long. The weekend before that, people taking too long, and if the marshal's held responsible then maybe they're the one who gets a little fine. Go ahead. Yeah. Hey. You're not even doing your job. <laughs> Keep the marshal responsible. I, that's a good point about poker, though. That is an interesting way. Instead of like, if there were to do something with the, the time system, it's like, we're not going to have people calling timeouts, but it's like, we've just, we're just going to alert you. You've used one of your, one of your timeouts, basically, or something along those lines. Um, that's, that, is, that is an interesting idea. Brody, what do you think? How many timeouts are you using? Yeah, I mean, I would say Brad brought up an interesting idea that I had no idea about poker, but that's a terrible comparison when it comes to disc golf. And the reason for that is a 25-foot putt from the leader in the tournament on Thursday on hole 14, it's not exciting to watch that guy take forever to try to make that putt. On hole 17, on Sunday, the leader stepping up to a 25-foot putt and all of a sudden backs off. Now there's something to be talking about. What's going on? Is he, is he, is he, is he falling apart? Is he getting nervous? Is he getting, we can talk, we can have a conversation. Those two things are very different. Obviously too, it's also very different. A 20 foot putt and someone in the woods that takes 15, 20 seconds just to get to their disc in the woods. Those two things are also very different. So to me, again, this golf has come from the sport golf. They have figured out the situation because not every situation is the same in golf. Not every situation is the same in disc golf. So how do you, how do you combat that? You can't just say 30 se- the 30 second rule is so dumb. You can't just say like, this is how much time you have because people are going to abuse it in situ- certain situ- situations and people um, are going to need more time in other situations, right? We almost saw that with Gannon Burr on hole 18. I mean, that would have been silly if he would have just had to like chuck a shot up because someone was like three, two, what? Like, I don't think that's what we need necessarily disc golf. So to me, it's just, it's a no brainer. Just literally do what golf does. Well, and, and you and Hunter are right in the sense that yes, like the, the perfect world is obviously where players hands don't have to be held and they can use their time appropriately. Right. If you're, if you have a really quick, easy shot, you step up and throw it. If you have a shot that demands a little more thought and time, you use that time. Um, but it, yeah, it goes back to this. I think right now the biggest issue is because disc golf is trying to play it both ways. You have some people that will sit there and count the 30 seconds and you have some people who won't. And it, and it creates this really weird mix instead of just going one way or another. But also if you have the first, if you, if you throw your tee shot and you have the first shot coming up, and you want a lot of time for that shot, and you sprint to your shot while everyone else is walking fast behind you, then you can take a lot more time because you sprinted there. Not under current PDJ rules. Correct. And that's what I'm <laughs> saying. Those rules are dumb. Yeah, no, it is. Yeah, it's crazy. If you walk super, super slow to your disc, you should not be able to get as much time as someone that sprints to their disc. Here's, yeah. a, here's an interesting thought. Walking speed, so- it's, it's big. <laughs> If I'm, on, if I'm on lead card, right, and I have cameras, mm-hmm. and I do what Brody said, right? Like I kick, 
Uh, I'm up there and I'm the first person to throw and I just sprint up there. I like this. I know where you're right? going with this. <laughs> and can't I be like, well, I got to wait for the cameras to get set up. So now yeah, I have yeah. an additional like 20 seconds because yeah. I'm waiting well, for cameras to get set up before I can actually start my 30 seconds because the, yeah. then you can't say anything because I'm like, well, the Joe Mez slow cam, slow cam guy wasn't ready yet. The, I got it. Everyone good? It's been, it's been a long time since I've been on coverage, but the few times that I've been on coverage, there has been times where like the camera guys and the, I don't think they're doing this anymore, but back in the day, they would tell you like when to, th when you're good to throw. Yeah. Like well, people funny. would literally be waiting for the camera guy to get set up and be like, are you good? Okay. And then they would yeah. start the routine, which is why. Well, Isn't another... that an unfair advantage or unfair disadvantage looking how, depending yeah, on how you look yeah, at it, it the way. card and chase card have over the rest of the field. Sure. It, 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 probably, it goes back to the back and forth where it's like, at the same time as the 30 second rule in the in those rules you have language that's ambiguous such as addressing your lie what does that even mean or reasonable amount of time to address your lie like there are things it, it's sure. it's such a back and forth you can't throw in specifics with the ambiguous language and expect it um to ever be agreed upon really um yeah, brody right. go ahead oh, sorry i had one more thing but brody you don't think it'd be electric to have somebody use one of their timeouts on day one and then be just down to one by the end of the tournament. The Golly first geez. thing, the first right, thing I can't, thought of when they announced this rule. I take extra rule, time. Sorry, the, I'm out the disc golf. So literally, ridiculous. the first thing I thought of when they announced this rule was like the idea of like when is the like in in football we always talk about like wasting your timeouts. Like oh now you don't have your timeouts for the fourth quarter or whatever. Like what is the equivalent in disc golf? Like, like somebody like. Just, Oh, like, you didn't ooh, save your timeout you took... for the back nine? Like, terrible timeout yeah. management. Like, I can see yeah, way... Really too bad see, you like... took 35 seconds on that putt <laughs> on the uh, hole two. Yeah, like, round round one on Friday, Gannon on hole fours, running out of the trees, going, timeout, timeout, timeout! <laughs> like, what are yeah. we doing? Like, I don't, I don't know, that, I don't know that, if we need that. that. But that, so that's that's kind of what I was saying, is that it can be applied afterwards, right? Hey, you took too long, that's one of your timeouts. You we should try and next year, I don't know when they ask for these things, but next year we should have like an internal foundation contest where we try and write the most absurd rules that we think actually might get considered. I don't think they're PDJs. Like, I don't think you submit them. I think the, like, there's, a we're going to have to find a mole. Then we're going to need a mole. Somebody has, somebody has got to get on the board. Is, I think they've yeah. got, I think they've got like one of those fair games with all those balloons <laughs> <laughs> and they just walk up and take a dart and hit. And then whatever the balloon pops, behind it it's like a new rule change and they're like all right that's what we're gonna that's what we're gonna throw out this year yeah well, I, I will say the pdga whoever they hired for social media is savage he seems to know what he's doing because like why single out the timeout <laughs> rule to post on your own social media to remind everyone like hey time to care about like there was a lot of other rules that were actually like solid rules that were like yeah. okay that one makes sense but he singled out the timeout rule he, he also responded back man. to the dude and was like nah your form's Heck of awk or whatever he said. Like no, that, he, that they're I on to someone. Dude, for that, a governing body, man. That I don't think should happen though. Like Hunter. we're not he's not the Wendy's social media <laughs> yeah, exactly. guy. Exactly. Like, you're not you're not some random company where whatever, you just dude, go, it's more interesting than what we had before, it. though. No, I'll I, take I, it. I, no, I, I agree. No, I agree. I just don't know if you want someone like that's willing to do Is that, that how I would do it. Personally, that's a big, that's but a big I love jerk being move. on this side watching. Yeah, it's a big jerk the, move. Big jerk move. Take I extra really time. liked the passive aggressive uh, caption where they were like, or the pinned comment where he's like, um, if you want to continue commenting on this post, you can. That's where our social media manager will read it. Or you can do it the official way and actually submit it to the PDJ website. Like basically maybe, saying, we maybe, don't care about your comments. Maybe they go, maybe they're Funny. going like the heel route, which would be a wild thing for a governing <laughs> body. Like it'd be the first time ever a governing body he said f you I to all the people it. that are paying us I but it could it. be it would be electric it would yeah. be it would be very yeah, imagine, interesting imagine calling them out on instagram and then you log into your pdga page and you've been banned they take your rating down 200 points yeah. oh, that'd, <laughs> oh, brutal. Yeah. that'd be fun that's yeah. a lifelong goal for me try to get my oh. rating slashed anyways all right we're gonna move on uh gotta talk about the kevin jones drama um Obviously, uh, we now heard there was there's another departure from Prodigy Vino, but this question still stands um, more so asking about it in relation to the Innova move. So Kevin Jones was announced to Innova via DGN commercial, um, an electric commercial, if you saw it. Very, very great audio. Uh, before competing with his new bag, do you like this move from Innova to land KJ? Do you think it makes sense for them? So we're kind of looking to get your take on this from Innova's perspective, not really having to do with Prodigy. What do you think about this move, Hunter? I, I really like this move for Innova, assuming they didn't pay so much. 
um, which I think is a pretty safe assumption knowing what we know about how Kevin left Prodigy. I would assume Innova picked him up for relatively cheap, which means they have now acquired someone who statistically has a high ceiling. He's shown us before he can compete on big stages. He's done it, right? That He has a high ceiling. He just hasn't been there in a while. So it's a no-risk pickup because if Kevin Jones, this was the big story moment, he throws in of a whatever, and the rest of the year he finishes an average of 60th, everyone's going to forget. No one's going to think anything of it. Whereas the storyline with Kevin up to this point has been like, man, this is like so underperforming. Prodigy really like put all their eggs in his basket, and it's just he, he fumbled them and cracked them all. Innova, though, also has the opportunity of all Kevin has to do is become a top 25 guy, which he is more than capable of. And now it looks like, oh, my word, it was the plastic the whole time. As soon as he switched back to Innova plastic, he became the guy. And so Innova has basically a very little risk, whatever they paid him. If I, assuming what I know historically about Innova contracts, it was probably a like plastic sales and like performance bonus and that's that maybe a very small guarantee but whatever the guarantee is really the only risk for pretty much as much upside as you could have and if the guy doesn't perform what'd you lose no one's expecting him to right now yeah i mean there's always there is always the upside on the table whenever you have a player who's kind of in a decline especially one that came from maybe being a, a better player at one point to where you could be the company that turns things around. There's, there's definitely some, um, some value in that. Brad, what do you think about Kevin Jones? In Are you a fan? It's fine. I mean, he could have gone anywhere. He's, he's a talented player who can throw discs. Like he could throw any company. I think Innova was a, it was a good choice for them because they, like Hunter said, they don't have to pay him that much. Not that they advertise their contracts anyways, but uh, I don't know if there's any Innova discs that are named after sound design. We'll see about that. Um, and, and really, he, you know, at this point, based on the last couple years of performance, he, it, it's not like he's commanding a disc line or anything crazy. And because they historically haven't paid a ton of money, you know, big flashy contracts, they're able to just pick them up like that the middle of the season. I, uh, I'm really interested in what happens with Bino, but that wasn't part of the question. Um, for Innova, yeah, it's, it's, it's fine. They, they have a lot of players. They have like one player at the very top on the MPO. Everybody else is a little bit mid-pack, and then you have the guys who have gone to the media side. So there's no reason not to bring on a young, talented, superstar level player even if his performance has been declining. Yeah, you definitely, when you position yourself the way Innova has, you definitely do leave yourself um, to where, like you mentioned, they may have just enough room in their payroll to just, if stuff does pop up throughout the season like this, to, to be able to grab them. But it's not something we typically see in disc golf. Um, Brody, what do you think about the Kevin Jones mood? Do you think it makes sense for them? Um, what do you think their angle is? Yeah, let's break down a couple of things. I think we can all agree that most of these disc manufacturers have the ability to give the right disc to the players. Now, the one thing with prodigy that a lot of people said was they just have flippy discs. It's very, very difficult to find overstable discs. Now the, the issue here is Kevin is a Heiser flip guy. He's not a Gannon Burr trying to throw everything on flex line. So the idea of him going to another manufacturer and all of a sudden like, Oh wow, these discs are so much better for my game. Doesn't really make sense, too much sense to me because his game would make sense with a prodigy who has flippy discs. Obviously, you also have Gannon Burr, Isaac Robinson, two guys that were very successful. Don't forget about Chris Dickerson. Very successful with Prodigy Disc as well. Um, I think it's going to be all coming down to the marketing. What is Innova going to be able to do with Kevin Jones? That's what, if they can have a way of marketing better, I think Prodigy, it does seem like they want to kind of go in a different uh, direction than Kevin. So that makes sense to me. But hear me out real quick. I'm going to compare this a little bit to the housing market. I don't know if this makes sense or not, but in my Ooh. head it does. So we'll see if I do it. The worst time to sell a house is when no one is looking to buy a house. The best time to sell a house is when everyone's trying to buy a house. So Innova's over here. No one's trying to buy a house right now. No one's interested. And we got players just, hey, for sale over here, for sale over here. And Innova's like, oh, we'll take that. Oh, we'll take that. Because no one's interested in buying houses right now. So I think Innova's kind of scooping up a bunch of stuff. 
Yeah, that's I don't know if that makes sense. No, that makes a lot of sense. You're you're absolutely right. It, it this is kind of unprecedented, but yeah, there could be there could be a very very great value play based on the, the lack of demand from anybody else who's yeah. not in that mode right now. Like, um, I, like were they fighting to get his contract over other manufacturers? Right. Um, Jake, wrap it up for us. Thoughts on Kevin Jones to Innova? Yeah, I look, I kind of view it as a personality hire, which I feel like Innova has a pretty good set of personalities on their team right i mean they have like uh i think it was brad was talking about they have pretty much the top player in the world right now and then there's kind of a drop off in the mpo but what they do have is guys who are pretty active in the media guys who are very likable and kevin jones brings a new element with his music and i don't want to call kevin jones career dead but it has been flatlining for a little while and he's gonna need to start picking it up soon um and that's not saying i mean i do like kevin jones a lot but so far this season, I think his best finish is maybe 25th or 24th I saw earlier. That's really tough. So the thing is, he's still a likable guy. He's still going to put out his music. He's going to be big in the media. And I like that. My big question that no one has asked so far that I thought was going to come up is who is going to sell more discs for Innova, Kevin Jones or Bill Nye the Science Guy? Because <laughs> they picked him up too. Let's not forget about that. Bill Nye, Ooh. another personality hire probably. I don't Ooh. know Bill Nye's game that well. but. Not you know, I think in. that's what you got to got to think about is, you know, how many discs is he really going to move? Because they're not picking him up, picking him up to win tournaments. They're not picking up Bill Nye to win tournaments. I'm just making that comparison because I am curious to see, you know, what is Kevin Jones going to bring to Innova? I agree with uh, Hunter. It is a low risk play. I think Kevin Jones is going to be consistently in the mid 20s, mid 30s for the rest of the season. But if he picks it up, hey, good for them. They, they got him on the low. You know, and the thing about Innova, you mentioned the personality hires is if you look back in, in, in their company's history, now, they, I do think a lot of like the more celebrity um, players have kind of fell in their lap just because they're a huge disc golf company. But like they've always been after the personality hire. And maybe that is just, I mean, that, I'm sure that's a part of their reasoning for Kevin Jones, but maybe that's the entire reason. Maybe they're thinking Kevin Jones, whatever he is a disc golfer, he's still a likable guy. Maybe he becomes another guy who who works his way into some content the way that uh, Big German Sexton have and, and kept that relevancy that way. Um that's that is definitely an angle that Innova likes is is having they want faces they they don't they don't just go out and hire a ton of uh, a ton of depth but they want faces for sure. Can I hey, throw something out here? Throw it out there. Yeah. Now I'm not one to like to stir up things. Oh no, certainly not. Hmm. Absolutely, but if what you guys said was true on Griplock today, mm -hmm. is there something illegal that happened here? Is it illegal to basically not have Kevin Jones ever on the quote unquote free market? Because it, to me, it seems like a, just hear me out. I uh, surely, surely out. not <laughs> illegal to, to who? <laughs> to who? Yeah. No, no, <laughs> There's no, no tampering laws. No, no, no. All I'm saying is I don't know how it works in contract wise. I don't know how it works, but if like discraft, if, mm -hmm. uh, if uh, dynamic, if they were never able to get to Kevin Jones because Prodigy it, was who's good enforcing for, this, is hear There's me no out. Just hear got, me out. I, I have a good Prodigy, analogy. I think will get through to, to Brody. Is, well, you it, think is that what you guys are telling me? Though, yeah. Prodigy reached out to Innova and basically did like a back backdoor deal. Well, this yeah. is. I'm gonna go right? back to the housing. Harrison, if you that's may. not illegal at all. Uh, let me, I don't let know. me just go into the housing. Yeah, Hunter, I know what Hunter's Harrison, gonna say here. This you, makes if sense. If I may, because basically what could happen, right, is I have a house, right, right now, sitting in it, basement. Uh, not to flex, but yeah, sick, um, dude. You got basement. <laughs> if I reached out to a real estate agent and I'm like, hey, I want to sell my house, and they were like, I like your house, I'm gonna buy it before it ever hits the market, or they start plugging it into the MLS and they can reach out to a friend and be like, hey. This house is coming to the market. I know you've got a guy who's looking for something similar. Do you want to look at it pre-market? They can sign the contract and it never hit the market. What you're referring to, Happen, Brody, happens is, all the time. is tampering. And it's what Kirk Cousins and the Falcons just got busted on a few That's months ago. That's team sports it's stuff? A, it's, well, it's a league-enforced thing. It, okay. if, if there was a disc golf league and those manufacturers were teams and they could say something like that where, like, if 
a player contract had like the NFL has like all these different rules for timelines on when you're allowed to talk to players. Now they break these rules all the time sure. um, because how are they going to stop you from talking to one another? Um, but like there are, there are a lot of rules in place, but yeah. And this, they're, 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 they're not laws. Rules. They're like sports laws, but there's also yeah. rules and stuff in like the workforce that like you personally can't like some companies, you can't go out and like take or uh, apply for other jobs when you're under them. That's certain like non competes and stuff, which actually are becoming illegal apparently. But if, yeah, oh, it would really? be one thing. Okay. Those are it, different things. If Prodigy had something, but like they're the ones that started it. Yeah, so. but you see, you, you, I understood you it. You see too. Where, I'm, where, where my uh, my idea was is like if I'm discrafted, I was like, well, sure, dynamic, and I'm like, wow, I didn't even have a chance to get him because what, he just handed yeah. off. What I understand is it's not it was, legal. It's it was not almost legal. more like uh, the Prodigy owner basically went to Innova, negotiated this deal. And then presented it to Kevin, and Kevin could have been like, "Nah, screw that, I'm out." Oh, I'm for sure, agency. for yeah. sure. And then he could have, but he was probably just like, "Why wouldn't I just take the deal? I have it right in front of me. Easy transition." No, oh, yeah. Is so. it any different than trades and in, in like team sports? Like you don't have to advertise your trade talks, but you can if you want to stir things up. Yeah. Is there any difference there? I don't. I don't yeah, I don't know how all of that's refereed as far as what what needs to well, be. I think the, the big thing is like our governing bodies have timeouts to worry yeah, about. Yeah, we're worried not about timeout where, rules right now. Not, not where Kevin players Jones. are going. So yeah. I'm worried yeah. about I'm worried about Discraft swooping in and getting Bill Nye now. There's that's, there's too yeah, much that's true. Was Bill Nye on the too market? Much going on. MVP I, missed out on Bill Nye, let's be honest. For yeah. sure. Yeah. Oh all that's, those that's science the science they're, they're with mad. Oh, You were talking about choke like of the year. Out. Does that mean You're, nothing? You're talking about choke of the year. That that's it right there. That could be choke of the year. Yeah. Maybe he can help us design better baskets. Um I don't think he's an actual scientist. No, he's not. Anyway, he, he can he can MVP throw a disc. Say woke. Who's that? Uh, Neil, is, <laughs> I, is it like just, Neil deGrasse Tyson? <laughs> is it is it Neil deGrasse Tyson or whatever his name is? Yeah, that's yeah. Like, is he the other, that's who MVP needs to go after. Like dueling giants, dueling just the big the big minds in science television. Bill, 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 Bill. Um, all right. Maybe maybe this is the actual full spin. They hot they got Kevin Jones so he can rewrite and remix. Bill Nye's intro song into a disc golf song that includes now the word T-Bird and Rock at least five times. Now we're thinking with our go. noggin. That's that's, that's the kind of together. that should be a bonus point for that. Um, it's not going to be. Um, and sorry, Round Billy one, bias. Front nine, Bill, Bill, Bill. Um, <laughs> it could work. <laughs> I'd make that my ringtone. We're going to go on to the last topic here. This is a fan submitted topic. Um, Really, it really strikes a chord with me because my son is most definitely a left-handed, uh, left-handed individual. I thought this well. was a political question at, when I first read it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was like, here we go. Oh, that's <laughs> buckle up, baby. It's election <laughs> I season. I didn't even. That's why think they brought me that. back, Brody. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, it is. What did you read it wrong? It is a political question now. <laughs> that's um, so funny. Does this is getting even funnier now when I read it? Does disc golf yeah. have an anti-lefty bias? Our course is being designed with only right-handed players in mind, and should left-handed players be catered to more? Is it merely coincidence that we rarely see lefties at the top of our sport? Um, Brad, what do you think? Justice for lefties. Cheating lefties. Uh, I think disc golf players have an anti-lefty bias because they can throw a backhand on the same spin that we want to throw forehands on and get major distance, right? Okay. I think... Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> so lefty backhand, righty forehand, yeah. same, same spin. So does disc golf... Are the courses designed with only right-hand players in mind? No, I don't think so. Um, that's like saying our course is designed to be anti forehand. Like, no, you just throw the best shot that's available. And the uh, merely coincidence part that 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 part's interesting. Um, they say that ten percent of the population is left-handed. I think less than ten percent of touring disc golf players are left-handed. So I think they're also underrepresented. If, if you're going by general population and how many lefties there are out in the world and how many lefties there are in this sport, at the pro level, I think we can only name a, a couple. I'm not going to rattle them off because I'm not good at that. But there aren't that many. And so I think if there were more lefties, you'd see more at the top. But there just aren't that many. 
So Brad, Brad thinks the numbers line up. He's seeing, he sees no problem with the numbers. Brody, do you, do you concur or is there, is there more to this than just the, the population? Yeah, I was going to discuss mainly just the pro tour courses, but I mean, I think it, I think it makes even, it's even easier of an argument if you discuss like the local courses, because here in Dallas, I think we have maybe one course, maybe two that was like designed in the last 10 years but we have tons of courses that have been designed, you know, 10 plus years from now. And you go back far enough, people weren't throwing forehands. So when you're playing a course, that wasn't even like a question. And that's why like some of these courses in Dallas, it's right to left. It's right to left, right to left, because that is just the backhand. Uh, so I'd say on older courses, 1000%. And then on the disc golf pro tour, it's, it is also a major anti-lefty bias as well there is not a single hole that really there's one hole at um uh well we didn't even play it this year but uh i'm blanking on the name champions cup uh wr jackson there's one hole in wr jackson where it's like i need to throw a really far turnover backhand one hole that's the only hole I can think of right now. Uh, maybe also the hole over at Portland Open. Okay, so two holes. Two holes two on holes. the entire time where someone's stepping up and going, man, I can throw a lefty hyzer back in. I have a big advantage. Otherwise, you can just throw a forehand. There's never a really hole you step up that says, hey, I have to throw a 400-plus turnover backhand. Yeah. And that's a problem. The for- oh, it is a problem. Doesn't like it, it. Yeah, it is a problem. What, what are we talking about here? Okay, justice for the lefties. I like this. Is good. This is I like to hear this kind of stuff. You know, we need some representation. Uh, Jake, do you agree? Are, are you thinking that the uh, we need to cater to the lefties more? I don't think we need to cater to the lefties more because I think there's a there seems to be a clear difference in in my head of for entertainment value on the pro tour. It seems like the bombing holes are holes that are going to favor more of the right hand backhand shot, just because they want players to get way out there, get some distance. Right. I think about hole one at Maple Hill, it's all open and downhill and, and beautiful. But if you're a lefty and you're throwing a backhand, you're going over those trees, you're bringing them more into play versus same going shot. over that lake. It's the same shot, but you're going over trees versus going over a lake, which same over shot. the lake, you're not going to hit a tree. Sure, I agree. But trees and lake. So either way, no you're throwing way me off my body. Lefty. I'm sorry. I mean, this is a violent. You, you, you said yeah. you would stop your own time timeout. Take Are you calling the time? There's a fly in here too. It's distracting me. And 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 I would agree that there that it is a slightly different shot. You're fading towards the woods. Like they're, they're, the woods are closer on the right. It's it's a little bit different shot. Look, we can we so can take up, we, or you're gonna get muted. Yeah. Jake, Sorry, bro. Yeah, that's, that's one of your rebuttal chips. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I do think you know I, I I take New London too. I do think there are just holes that play you know wide open bombing shots. They're just more made for right hand backhand shots. Um, I just don't know that course as well. I'm from Boston. I played Maple Hill a lot. That's what I'm thinking about. Either way, I think the technical shots are more made for lefties. I think they do favor their forehand a little bit more. I think their backhands can push a little bit further. They can get a little bit more shot shape. You know, not a lot of people are throwing right hand, uh, forehand hyzer flips, but I think that's a shot that resembles, you know, that lefty backhand the most. So I think the, the shorter technical holes, what I was trying to say, are more lefty favored, but I think the long bomber holes are more made for right hand backhand shots. Well, you mentioned New London. That actually is the perfect example because yeah. any lefty out there, that's their worst nightmare because all I'm that OB going with Maple Hill. I all that <laughs> well, all that OB on the right side of that those fairways, like trying to advance far down there um, without crashing because it's harder not to crash too sometimes. Like that, that's a yeah, that's a nightmare. Um, all right, Hunter, wrap it up for us, lefties. Do we? So uh, yeah, like both sides of the question here. Do we, is there a bias? And then also should we be catering kind of like Jake was mentioning there? I don't, I don't think there's an anti lefty bias. Cause I think that would more lean into it as intentional as much as there's a pro righty course designers. If you take, as Brad said, 90% of the population are right-handed players. Um, and as Brody alluded to, a lot of our course designers are older players, which would come from a backhand history. They're naturally going to see backhand lines. Even if they're trying to challenge backhand righty players, it's going to lean a little bit more right-handed friendly. I don't necessarily think that's an issue, mainly because as course designers try to get it harder, the danger is going to end up being more against righties because you're going to try to get right-handed backhands into trouble, which means it'll actually become more lefty-friendly on the Pro Tour. Um, what I think is an interesting part is it, is it a coincidence we rarely see lefties at the top of the sport? 
as Brad pointed out, 10% of the world is lefty. Well, I want to actually look at what we're seeing in disc golf right now with the FPO field. The FPO field, not as deep. One of the things that I think a reason why is if you look at the statistics, there's roughly twice as many male athletes as there are uh, female athletes in percentage to how many people there are of that gender, which means there is a bigger talent pool for male athletics that will eventually filter down to better athletes ending up in disc golf, whereas with a smaller talent pool in female athletics, they're getting gobbled up by a lot of the similar sports, such as the WNBA, so on and so forth. So I think it's similar with lefties. When you have only 10% of the population, and in disc golf, it's not that big of an advantage, whereas in other sports, it can be an advantage to be lefty. The talented lefty players are just in other sports. That's just mm. the nature of percentages. Could be. They're all pitching somewhere in the minor leagues right now. I was going to say, how many pitchers? What's the, what's the ratio of lefty pitchers <sighs> to righty pitchers, Trev? Oh, I would have to. I would have to say seventy thirty, maybe sixty five thirty five. I mean, it's it, definitely way you more. You see a lot of lefty arms. Well, the the biggest one um, is hockey. Um, and hockey left handedness doesn't even determine whether you play left handed or righty. Like, I mean, I'm right hand dominant. And I was a left handed hockey player, and in that sport, you see it switch back and forth almost interchangeably. Um, yeah, it's very interesting. I, I just thought disc golf. It, it's the idea, the concept of obviously courses are going to be designed with right-handed players in mind, because if you're, if I'm designing a course and I throw right-handed, the way I'm going to visualize shots is just like that. But I was only wondering, should we have our course designers for the pro tour be attacking a course design and thinking about left-handed players and right-handed players on a more equal plane as they design each hole? Should they be thinking to themselves, should the righty and the lefty have a equal chance to attack this course? And well, is that being thought of at all? Think of it this way. How many tournaments do we get through and we think, wow, that actually leaned a lot forehand heavy? Obviously, it's not a direct correlation, but we do see that a lot. Yeah, where, yeah. And like USDGC's one, and we've seen mm -hmm. Chris Glemons have continued success out there. Yeah, it I may just even think, out, yeah. I think, you know, I know the root of this question obviously came from, you might have been, are you the fan that submitted it, Trevor? Is this just no, all about? No, I am not, I am it's not. It's all about Brooks? No, that I'm you not. You take solace in the fact tells, that though. he has a really good chance at being great at other sports because yeah. there's a lefty need out there. No, he's toast. Like, dude, more someday money you're going to be like maybe 27th in the pro tour. If you're really awesome, like dude, no. you're ceiling. Chris Clemens made it pretty far. <laughs> Two things. First, Jake, apologies for cutting you off there. Um, it's, it's the way we go. You had a bad day pulling cards today. Was that what well, it was? No, I've had a great day. Um, oh. no, I, just <laughs> That's what it was. When you're saying a wide open hole, there's one advantage throwing left to your would, back. I yeah, actually, I, I actually will die on this hill. That is a harder shot if you're a lefty because the the trees are higher if up you, on the left side and are, the road and the road goes the other way. Yeah. The, the scary, the scary bad shot on that hole is throwing something that turns over if you're a right-handed player and you go into the crap on the right. That's the that's the worst spot to go. Lefties are never going over there. If you so turn over on the left, you're on hole two. You got to go over the trees anyway. Like I do I'd think much rather be in that spot than way over into the stuff that you don't even have an angle. Anyways, um, the second thing I was going to say, which I kind of forgot now, but <laughs> when we were talking about USDGC again, like that's not really proving my point. To me, I think they need to start incorporating more holes where it's a far backhand turnover. I agree. Not, not to where we can just throw a hyzer forehand and now it becomes, okay, who can throw the best hyzer forehand and hyzer backhand? Yeah. When you start adding in, uh, because again, like that's not beneficial. Really. Yeah, obviously Chris Clemens can play out well out there, but that's not super beneficial to lefties because none of those distances are far enough to where it's like, no, I can't throw a hyzer right. forehand. I actually have to throw a turnover back in, I, which is a much yeah. harder shot. I think there should be, yeah, I think there should be more times where right now, if you see a left or right shot, the best forehand players, um, really anybody who's good enough to make it a tour and has what you would say a good forehand for the tour is not even thinking about any other shot. There should be more times where you have a shot that maybe the elite forehand player, the best of the best can get there with a forehand, but you're forcing more players to throw that long turnover backhand because that is a super difficult shot. Like that's just not one. Yeah, I think there was a, there was a hole on the original open at Austin that had a Mando left where you had to sneak that like left backhand turnover around. Do you remember that one Brody? Say it again. It was, uh, it, there was like a tree. It was the original open at Austin that everybody hated. There was okay. like a tree that I think was Mando left and you had to throw like a long turning backhand to get sneak around it, like left to right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I was like, nope, nobody, nobody liked that shot, but I was like, that's a breath of fresh air. Like we never see that.
Yeah, the, the hard shots that we don't really ever see, because we all, we see a lot of holes like in the woods. We see a lot of holes where it's like that gradual turn to the right. Yeah. The ones where it would be like um, tough would be like, you got to throw it straight for a while and then turns to the right. Right. Because there you either have to throw a flip up forehand that flies full straight and then finishes, or you're throwing like a flippy backhand that turns at the very end. Yeah. You can't just throw a hyzer forehand because you're just going to go off too soon. So right. that, that's all I'm saying. And, and talking to some of the guys on tour, you know, it's like, oh, great. We have a lefty hole that's 370 feet. Yeah. There's a lot of holes where we get to, and they're like, oh, wow, I have to throw a lefty forehand 460. Yeah. Like it doesn't, it, no, it it's, doesn't, it's a grind. It take the longer forward. holes, what? the longer holes they have trouble with, and the shorter holes they don't. <laughs> yeah. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Watching Chris Clemens out there have to like just the, and all the lefties have to launch these flex forehands like over and over again. It's it's tough to watch, man. You're just like at some time at some point we're gonna need Tommy John surgery. It, it this can't go on. It's um, the last thing I'll last thing I'll say because I feel like this is the last thing I'll be able to say on this episode. How close are we to the ambidextrous disc golfer? Players oh, are starting you're to that same with guy it. that came up to me at Worlds and said that. I Am said I? that on the last episode. <laughs> Oh, it yeah. was after the last episode. And I said it. Or did you say oh. it? Trev- Trevor's son's the next one. He's the guy. No, yeah. dude. Not happening. My, I, I, Not I, happening? I, was, I don't know that there's that much of an advantage. No. I was telling you guys last time, I'm teaching my kid to throw left and right-handed. Well, then we'll see him on if tour. It, if it was a shout massive, if it was a massive advantage, we would see like a lefty, uh, uh, someone that has a forehand, lefty forehand, and a righty forehand. I've always said I think the only, yeah, the only Eagle benefit winning, uh, is being able to do European a step Open. out forehand both ways. Yeah. So scrambling for yeah. scrambling. Yeah. That that to me, I see the or like having it even being able to like step up and throw like maybe an overhand, but like that's really what I what it's I just, see. You're now you're now just practicing. You'd have to be practic. You're just adding way more stuff to practice when you already have something that you can do with less stuff to practice yeah i don't know that makes sense i don't I, we had a kid who was uh ambidextrous on our college disc golf team but he kind of just threw with one arm like he rarely used the other one my favorite is when you have people who have uh they've got a righty backhand and a lefty forehand and it's like Baseball that just it's the lefty backhand righty forehand so yeah it's like i'm sorry that doesn't really do much for you that's just not going to work out mm-hmm. um all right on to the finals topic hunter and brody good luck brody with the bias man you're never winning this Anti lefty. I can't wait, man. I can't wait for Hunter to come in smiling tomorrow at work because I gave him the win again. <laughs> it's gonna be great. Um, all right. <laughs> Finals topic. Um, I wrote this one down because I thought this Ricky stat that came out was like was really, really crazy. Um, so Ricky Wysocki has now won an elite series or major in 14 consecutive years, the longest such streak of all time. If he retired at the end of the season, how much would his major drought impact his legacy? How much of an impact is that going to have? Where would he stand among the all-time greats? And how would he be labeled as a player? Would players who have won less but were able to win majors in this tougher era overshadow him? I really wanted to ask this just because when I heard that stat, I was like, you know, he's really at this point, he is almost second to none in in longevity and dominance. And it's it's just crazy how most of the time we just talk about the major drought. Is that how much of a factor is that Hunter first or second? I'd like to go first. OK, go for it. Well, I would say Ricky second to one being Paul Macbeth, who is one elite series or major win away from doing it this year and tying Ricky's crazy record because Paul's at 13 just missing this year that Ricky just got. So that is an important fact to note. Um, but I to get, I really want to attack the second part, right? Was where would he stay among the all-time greats? And basically, would people who are winning more in this era overshadow him? My take is no. Um, if you look at the all-time majors list, he sits fourth on it currently. Basically, you have Ken and Paul at 18 and 17. Then you have Feldberg at seven. And then Ricky comes in at six. He's obviously a far cry from Macbeth. And I think that's more what it speaks to is what hurt him isn't necessarily the major drought per se. I don't think that's going to be a storyline that follows him forever. He has a Hall of Fame career already. I think what follows him forever that is more important is actually the opportunity cost of not necessarily people are going to look at it and be like, oh, dude, well, Ricky went that seven-year, eight-year stretch, whatever it ends up being without winning a major. It's more so... Paul during that time is 11 majors ahead of him like that. He can never be spoken in the same 
Pence is Paul because Ricky's not really going to be able to win 11 majors in front of him. That time all passed him. And a lot of those majors Ricky could have won would have been taken away from Paul's total major count, bringing them closer together. And then they would have a lot of times been the head-to-head matchup for the GOAT. So I think it's not necessarily the drought, but the opportunity cost during the drought when that's when Ricky should have been stacking up that it really could cost it. Because, I mean, he's, like I said, he's standing among giants. Feldberg isn't in the Hall of Fame, but I think that's just a matter of time. Barry Schultz is in the Hall of Fame. Paul's a shoe in for the Hall of Fame. And a lot of guys behind Ricky are in the Hall of Fame. So performance-wise, Ricky's a Hall of Fame player. He's there. It's just legacy-wise, you're always going to look at it. And, you know, to, for guys to even catch him, Eagle McMahon's four behind him. I think he has the best chance. Gannon Burr is five behind him. He has a good chance. It's not like these guys are about to overshadow him tomorrow. It's just Ricky could be at 10 and Paul at 13, but instead we're at 17 and 6. Okay. Okay. Opportunity cost. Yeah, that's a valid point for sure. For sure. Brody, weigh in. Yeah, a couple things here. First off, I think he is unfortunately going to be measured on his majors and not on his wins. Yeah, 14 consecutive years with the elite series or major. That's awesome. That is a great stat. But I think down the road with how like the era that he played in national tours were a thing. Then that went away. Disc golf pro tours just basically starting up in these last couple of years. So I think down the road. People are going to look at majors as something like, hey, that is what we're looking at. Not of like how many wins some guy won back in 2000s and uh, you know 1980s and 1990s. The other thing I think Hunter mentioned a little bit, he has been super overshadowed, unfortunately, by Paul, right? And now he's kind of getting overshadowed by the young guys with Eagle. Uh, Eagle, I wouldn't even consider him probably more mid-tier, but with Gannon and AB, and then you've got Eagle and Calvin. Heck, even Simon now is kind of being able to kind of overshadow him a little bit in this stage. So I think it is going to be something that people will talk about, unlike Hunter says. I think it will be something because people will look at it and say, well, Ricky actually did win a lot of majors, but he kind of did that back in that era, and he was never able to win another big one with this new era, this new crop of talent, like Paul has. Paul went out and won worlds in the new era, the new crop, right? Ricky hasn't done that yet. Also, media is way higher now. So I know you threw like Fel- Feldberg out there. Uh, Feldberg, uh, to me, like Climo, because he has the accolades and he's number one, he's someone that you don't really need the media. It's like that mystique, that like legend status. But someone like Felberg, I think that's someone that could fall through the cracks. Not a lot of media about the guy. No one really talks about the guy all that much, right? Um, you're going to have certain people like that that just kind of fall through the cracks and they're there on the list. Uh, I think that could potentially happen with some of Ricky's earlier wins as well, unless he does win one late. Yeah, I think when it comes to that, and that's kind of the point I was looking for is the idea that, you know, and it, we see it nowadays, and especially with basketball, you talk about MJ and LeBron and all that. Um, you, you do have this effect where, right, if, if he were to retire and not have any majors now, people it would be very easy for p- people to just go, well, look at the last time he won, won a major. You know, look where he did it. it and it, even though he's proven himself in this era winning other tournaments, there's always this idea that, that some um, – I don't know, because I guess it's a tough one because you have some people who could say, well, look, he won all the majors and he was winning other events, you know, during that era. It's not like like the the argument for, let's just say, uh, Jerry West just passed away. And a lot of people have been talking about Jerry West in basketball. And, you know, you can never compare Jerry West to today's league, right? Because he played in a completely different different era. era. A lot of times in sports, the arguments to illegitimize players is not based on necessarily the accolades they had in an era, but just simply could they compete in that era and did they compete in that era? So maybe for Ricky's case, it'll be he won all the accolades and he was still a very competitive player at the end of his time, even though he didn't win the major. It'll tough. To, it's tough to say since he has proven himself, Does is that going to be enough to say he was a legit player? We're not going to discredit his prior accomplishments. It's tough to say how we'll look at the, you know, 15, 20 years from now, how they'll look back at, at his career well, record. I do and- want to bring out one other point, too, which is uh, most of the names that Brody mentioned, minus A.B. and Gannon, were in the field at 2017 Worlds, which when we're removing ourselves from everything, you're going to look at the field and say, Ricky beat a Paul McBeth, a Simon Lazada, a Calvin Heimberg, a Chris Dickerson, a Matty O, 
at 2017 Worlds. I mean, Matteo like those, also took him like 20 years to get his first win. I'm just saying, when, we're looking, when you're looking at the history books, I don't think people are going to necessarily be like, oh, no, well, but that time, but you're Eva not, McMahon was only 16. But, like, he was but, on tour. But you're, yeah, but that's the, the whole, that's the whole thing is like, you're, you're you you can say the same thing about the Warriors. It's like, oh, this team beat the Warriors. It's like, yeah, but that was a different team three years ago than it is now. It's a different era. Winning winning in 2010 I is agree. different than winning in 2020. Looking, That's what people look saying, at. I'm just saying looking at the history books, I don't think the argument of he didn't beat X, Y, and Z player will hold up because he did right here, 2017. No, World. That's not what they'll Simon say, Zach. X, Y, and Z, Hunter. They'll say he won all his stuff in the 2010s. He never won anything past the 2010s. That's what they'll say. They won't look at the players say oh simon was in the field in the 2010s oh this they'll literally say that he just won in the 2010s and then later in his half pa- pa- part of his career he, he didn't win again winning, just not majors correct and that's yeah. a big thing that's yeah. the thing that people care about the most is majors yeah it, Calvin I hasn't think, got one simon hasn't got one yeah I mean, that's a calvin, big narrative around calvin too. never if calvin never wins a major he will not go down as one of the greatest players of all time i think so will ricky if ricky doesn't win another one is he one of the greatest players of all time if he doesn't win another one, yeah. If he's stuck, well, I mean, he freezes here. He wins a few more pro tours, but well, he freezes yeah, major. Disc golf, here. disc golf, the pro tour, all this stuff is very, very young. So there's not a big crop of people. So yeah, 60 years from now, there could that's that's what 240 majors or heck, PJ doesn't even care how many majors there are. There that could be 300 majors <laughs> could happen. Could there be a bunch of people in the next 60 years, 70 years that have six majors? And then all of a sudden, Ricky's career compared to theirs look completely different. Yeah, for sure. Right now, yes, Ricky is one of the top five players of all time. I think. I don't without think a major in the modern era. Correct. I don't think. I don't think you can. I don't think you can argue that. Never would. Yeah, I never would. But sixty years from now, if the guy doesn't win another major, we could be having a different argument. That's what Probably we're talking about. Dead. Legacy. <laughs> Your legacy is not what happens when you're well, alive. I'm just saying the legacy, I don't think, is going to be stained by the drought, per se. I think the legacy is going to be stained that he didn't pick more up when he could have with against Paul. I think oh, that's could, where... I, the, I think you could say both, yeah. I'm just sitting here trying to see which one of you makes more compelling arguments so I can decide who wins. <laughs> I, I think that what I've learned is that the... I think that if Ricky, like if Ricky's career were to end at the end of this year, like which it probably won't, um, he would have one of the more complex arguments. Like he would be a very interesting player 30 years from now to be talking about because of the fact that he was able to win in this era. But then you would have people on the other side be like, well, he didn't win a major in this era. And I I think they kind of almost cancel out to some extent. Like he's been dominant enough in this era without the major to say like, not to say, well, he couldn't beat those players. Like, he was talented enough. I don't know. I don't you know. You want a but, bonus Ricky I, stat? This isn't for points. This is just a fun one I noticed. And I think someone tweeted it, actually, is where I saw it. He, Ricky, more than likely, will pass Paul for all-time career earnings. I did season. see that. It's at 733. Paul's at 748. It, Trevor, here's the thing. At the end of the it's day, good. it's it's, a, it's it's very unfair. Because we all know golf, disc golf, any sport, really, you have to have some luck on your side to go your way to actually end up winning. It's not just playing well. You have to have some good kicks. You have to have an umbrella kick you back in bounds. You have to have things go your way. Yeah. And unfortunately, we've seen Ricky win in this era. Heck, he was one of the best players, the best player, had the best season a couple of years ago in this era. He, If he just doesn't get the luck to go his way in those tournaments that We've all said mean more. Unfortunately, it's going to be unfair, but people will penalize him for that. Should they? No, but people will. What breaks would you say you didn't get on this episode of Debate Night? I probably shouldn't have said anything until after Jake said that throwing a wide open (laughs) hole shot. Lefty actually is a lot harder. Any like images from the tea pad we can look at? I just, I, I know, know what you're saying. <laughs> We're throwing into a bunch of trees left or right. If you ask Yuli that, he thinks it's one of the worst holes ever because there's a bunch of Christmas trees all over. Isn't interesting. No, he hits the, the road. road. He hits the, the road. road. All I'm saying is most guys on Been that hole there. are trying to throw as far as they can. Yeah, you're right. And if I do it think the farther Christmas you get tree, down, the more it's balanced. I had one thing I wanted to say about the Ricky question, if you don't mind. You, you may. They don't call it the Paul era, do they? It's they true. call it the Ricky Paul era. They, they, so legacy-wise, well, I mean, they do call he's it the fine. Paul McBeth effect. 
<laughs> no, you got that's a point though, Brad. That is a point. Let's listen. When you talk about the era, we do call it the Paul and Ricky era. Hunter, dude, watch it. All right. I'm bumping in everything. Um, yeah, that's that is true. We do, you know, we do throw him in there. So yeah, legacy wise, he's fine. Does that make it worse though? Because we're just always gonna Ooh, be talking right. about comparing him even more. You guys all got sick webcam tricks. All right, Hunter, do your wrap up speech like that. Oh, oh no. Um I don't really have a good wrap up speech, but I am Wait, crying now. One? This so, yeah, I, <laughs> um, I just want to thank my mom and dad, uh, really for this. Um, don't know how they played into it, but they didn't teach me how to play disc golf. They actually have no effect on my knowledge, but I feel like they should be right now. And um, <laughs> yeah, this win just means a lot to me. It's a really, really special win for me here. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I just want to thank you all for being a part of it. That's all. How does he do that? A lot of foundation bias in this episode. I'm seeing it's no longer Brody bias. Listen, guys, yeah, this, this felt like foundation this versus the Hunter Brody era. I don't know. I didn't say it. I, this is what the I, comments I, are saying. But is it the Hunter era or the Brody era? If the comments come after you talking about throwing a wide open hole shot, that there's more advantage for lefty <laughs> versus righty. You're, that was the worst hole you could have picked. That's that's my only thing. You could have literally picked any hole that actually you need to shape a shot, and you just picked a wide open hole. I if there's one thing I if there's one thing I learned from the lovely experience of being on this show, it's that they'll come at me for everything else, not actually what I said. Like you so, know, holes really hard if you're a lefty. Hole three. Hey guys, you have to get the hole yeah. three. Hole three is very hard if you're a lefty. You have to have a you have to have a nasty late flex forehand that's about three seventy five. That's a three hard tough. shot. Yeah, it's tough. Three tough. Way harder than hole one, where you can just launch a backhand as far as you want and try to get a five hundred and fifty thousand <laughs> you know, dollar check or whatever it was that one year. I like that. Yeah, never forget. You know, what comments, say something not, Say something nice about Jake in the comments down below. I don't want it. Say I don't oh, deserve it. Yeah. Oh. Third place. I don't deserve it. I like that. He's a competitor. He's a competitor. Um, no, let, let us know down below. Um, is the Brody bias real? Will he ever win an episode of this of this show? I think so. I've handed you wins over the years. You can't, you can't. I still just, don't know how Hunter's argument was better than mine at the end. Just, you never said anything. You kind of well, just. Yeah, you did, you did, I did quietly win. You kind of all of a sudden just gave I didn't say it was better. I didn't say it was better. I would have oh, said okay. they were on equal score, footing. Dude. Oh, did he no, have a you score? Had, he had a one point lead. He had a score. Oh, okay. okay. I gave you both a seven out of 10. I thought they were both adequate arguments. And exactly. I, I, yeah, I, that's, that's all I'll say. I think you lost for disrespecting Jake's time. Yeah, that's fine. Maybe I got to protect my boy Jake. I said I Jake. should have lost the point for that. that Justice that's, for I, Jake. I took the L. I apologize. I got to protect my boy Jake. I got to keep my. I well, it's been like three episodes safe. without me interrupting someone. So that was pretty good. That's like uh, I'll, I'll, I'll update I'll, the case. I'll, I'll update the board. Of <laughs> it's like been this many, many days. Episodes since I've interrupted <laughs> someone. All right, uh, so I'll throw up the QR code for me. Uh, if you want to submit a topic for debate night, such as the controversial lefty bias topic, um, respect for Jake. Uh, you can submit this. You can scan the QR code on the screen, or click the link in the bio, and you can submit any topic you could ever think of. We get awesome topics every week, and I sift through them and find some, and it's a great time. And I appreciate you watching the show and submitting, and make sure to continue doing so because we'll be back next week with another episode that Brody probably won't win. And here's the thing: <laughs> if people are saying, "Why does Brody interrupt all the time?" I'm the type of guy that if I'm walking down the street and I see an old lady get her purse stolen, I don't just pull my phone out and film it. I freaking run after and tackle that guy. Okay, I'm that. Jake, type now of guy. you're a purse thief. Yeah. Now I'm like, now I'm the worst man in the world. Oh, Oof. I'm a, I'm, okay. We're gonna make a new right. shirt for Jake that says, "This guy sucks." And it's Jake. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, my family and friends would buy a lot of this. So, <laughs> all right, good show, boys. Bye.